first of all, talk about caching. Uh, I will start with the context of the data locality challenges in large-scale data lake. And then I'll talk about a caching framework, which is Aluxio, which is open source, and talk about its use cases and its technologies and give an overview. And then Jim will talk about his practice, production practice in Uber, leveraging Aluxio as a cache for Presto and HDFS data node. So um, first of all, let's start with the evolution of the modern data stack. So, we think about 10 years ago, we were in the Hadoop era, and now we are today having something that they call like a modern data stack or big data. And I want to highlight three of the most impactful trends here. And the first one is from the tightly coupled map reduce and HDFS to the compute storage separation, which means we used to have MapReduce and HDFS together, but now we have a compute storage separation to, uh, to have this, to scale them independently. And the second trend is from on-prem HDFS to cloud data lake, which means like you're shifting to the cloud and you're also shifting from the HDFS kind of file system to the cloud data lake system. Although like we see like the trends of cloud migration, I know a lot of companies are having more complicated uh, system, so they are kind of like a mix or on the way of the migration. So we we'll see like HDFS, Cloud Data Lakes, S3, GCS, Azure Blob, and together in, in e either a single cloud or hybrid cloud environments. And finally, we are from the YARN to Kubernetes containerization, like orchestration. So all of these evolution or the trends are leading to a more elastic, cheaper, and easier to manage and more scalable modern data stack or data infra we talk about. So we talk about, today we talk about big data. We're not talking about these like relational like databases. We talk about big data analytics kind of workloads. And as you notice, like all of these trends and compute storage separation, cloud data lake, containerization, Kubernetes. So we're actually losing data locality. So if you're familiar with data locality, it used to be a design principle for job scheduling in the MapReduce or the, the Hadoop era 10 years ago, but it's not a case anymore in, uh, in this day. So you see like from the IO perspective, usually your, your data is traveled from S3 to your local compute, which means that if your data is not local, you're losing data locality. So it depends on your network and your scale of the data, it might be a problem for you. So the implication of like lack of data locality or low data locality is in your performance, in your like cost, as well as complexity. So which means like if your data is remote from your compute applications, for example, they're in a different region or in different clouds or hybrid cloud, you will have some slow um, like access speed or you have a high latency. And also, we all know that S3 kind of cloud storage, they charge by the number of requests or number of operations. So if it's remote, it means like, depending on your, if your application is data intensive, it is data intensive and it's remote, they will charge both get operations costs as well as data egress or data transfer costs. And we, uh, as you can see, like depending on your SLAs or your requirements for latency, so you might need to copy your data from S3 to your local machine of the compute node, which is get, making your data engineering or ETL, these kind of process very complex, time consuming and uh, error prone. So here, but we still have a chance here because the number 10% is something that we have observed with our open source community because like Aluxio is a big data cache and we have insights into the data access patterns of the many open source users. So 10% is a percentage that we've seen very frequently, a very typical percentage of hard data. And actually most of the companies are having less than 10% of the data. So I will take Uber, like Jing's example is that it's less than 1% of their disk can handle half of their daily access data. So maybe you don't have your insights into your data access pattern, but actually your percentage of hot data is not very large. So it gets really important to think about caching here to help bridge the gap between your compute and storage to bring your data locality back. 
And caching can help you with performances because you get your local speed for your compute node and also can save costs, like I mentioned before, is S3 get costs and S3 egress costs. And also it can prevent the network congestion by uh, making like less requests directly from your compute node to your storage. And it can also offload your under storage because, because sometimes your compute nodes have very spiky, uh, have, have, can create huge traffic spikes to your under storage. So depending on what storage you're using, so maybe it can overload it. So cache can serve as a buffer or a shield to protect your storage. And I want to introduce Aluxio as a very critical caching framework in the open source data stack. I don't know how many of you have heard of Aluxio, but, well, but we are some in between of the compute frameworks and the storage systems, which means we are a big data cache layer to cache file level data. And we are not like Redis, and I also often got questions of, like what's the difference between Aluxio and Redis. It's actually Aluxio handles much larger data than Redis. It's usually not using the memory, it's using the SSD disks. So we are handling like gigabytes or even terabytes of cache. And also Aluxio um, can work across different types of storage systems. As you can see. Oops, seems like it's not that stable. Um, as you can see from the bottom, like we work, we, can, we are compatible with all of these different kinds of storage systems. And the beauty is that we provide a virtualization layers, which means you can access any, um, any like storage system in any location, in any environment through uh, Aluxio's single namespace. And also Aluxio provides cache, which means you can serve your data quickly to these compute engines, including the big data kind of like SQL kind of Presto Trino workloads like Spark SQL, as well as we are seeing more um, emerging machine learning, deep learning kinds of workloads using Aluxio as a cache. And then we are a very vibrant open source community and we started from AMP Lab. It's the same lab as where Apache Spark was born. And we have, we are, we have top ranking um, open source project. We are Java based and we were like top, top 10 most critical Java based open source project and have many like community members uh, like using us or contributing to our project. So you are very welcome to enter our Slack, check our GitHub and our website. So our technology journey also aligned with the 10 year trend that I talked about in the beginning. And we started from serving the big data workloads and we started as a off heap cache for Spark because we were from the same AMP lab as Spark. And then we work closely with the cross community like Presto community, like Trino community, and right now we are more shifting to the AI workloads. So you might ask why we need a cache for AI, right? Um, I wanna briefly touch upon the AI part as well, because usually when you are training in the cloud and your data source and your data lake is in S3, usually it will take a lot of time like doing the data loading and well, uh, with, it begins in the each epoch which means that you spend a lot of time in data loading in, in your training and your GPUs are, are stay there idle. So using a cache can really speed up like the data loading process to make it no longer a bottleneck for your training. So that's, that's, that's the use case we've seen emerging recently for deep learning and AI and it's usually people who are using PyTorch or Ray as their training engine. Uh, see here are a lot of companies using Luxio, including like Uber, Mike Lake there, and Meta, and also a lot of like the internet companies, financial services companies using Aluxio. So uh, we welcome everyone sitting here to join this community and, and start using Aluxio, see if you have a fit. So um, let me talk about from the technical side. So we talk about caching framework. So Aluxio provides two types of caching framework. So the first one here, it's something we call embedded cache or local cache. So this is something that Uber is in production and also Meta is in production. So this kind of cache is running as a library in the application. Um, it's actually leveraging the local storage for fast access of hot data from your uh, remote storage. So this embedded cache really um, 
such as Presto and HDFS data node as a library to run within that. And uh, Jim will talk about details of how he runs Presto cache and then H, uh, cache for HDFS data node in his part. And this caching library is lightweighted and it can leverage the local or uh, S, uh, SSDs or NVMEs in a single machine. So as a result, this kind of cache uh, option is ideal uh, when your hard data can fit within your storage capacity or your scheduler of your application can be aware or take advantage of the data affinity. And I think Jing will talk about the soft affinity scheduling in his part. And the second one is the distributed cache. And this one is Aluxio running as a cluster. So which means Aluxio can be an independent or dedicated caching service. So uh, this caching service can serve the needs if you need like a larger cache or dedicated cache, you want to share your cache uh, across the applications. For example, you want to use the cache for your Spark ETL workloads and then after ETL, you want to use a Luxio cache uh, to serve the Presto like SQL kind of workloads. And also this distributed cache can scale horizontally. So uh, depending on your capacity, like the hot data, like the size of the hot data and the capacity of your system. So the cluster can scale like horizontally, you can add more nodes to the Aluxio distributed cache. So you might uh, be curious about if we can combine two caches together. So here I have a diagram showing that you use the embedded cache as your L1 cache and then use the distributed cache as your L2 cache. Although it's not really leveraging, leveraged by Uber, but we really recommend this multi-tier caching to be um, like to serve the needs if you need like a more um, dedicated or more tiered cache to serve your both hot data and warm data together. So you can see from this diagram, I have Presto as an example here, and it's using a Luxo embedded cache as the L1 cache, and then with the local SSDs of the Presto worker for the hardest data. And then if the cache miss, and there is an Aluxio distributed cache layer to serve the warm data. And if the both cache miss, and uh, you will be um, like retrieving data directly from your storage system like HDFS or S3. So moving to the Presto uh, cache here, I believe Jim will mention this in his part two. I'm just going, going to give a very oh, a brief overview here. So this is actually battle tested in Uber and Meta and they have been using this in production for years. And it's actually, if when Presto is reading the data from extra, external storage, it's actually reading data from the, the SSDs from of the Presto workers. I just can't touch this. Okay. So, and we also support like different table formats like Hudi, Delta Lake, and High Tables. And we support like Parquet Org or CSV files. Like I mentioned before, it's a file cache. And it's also like fully optimized for you to leverage the, the local disk of your, of your Presto worker machine. And uh, Oxio also supports different cache policies. Okay, thanks. So the, I wanna talk, briefly talk about the cache eviction and mission policy here. So uh, from the cache eviction policy perspective, it supports the least recently used or FIFO cache eviction policy. So you can customize this. And you can also customize cache eviction policy, uh, admission policy and to to, um, to uh, deter de determine what should be in the cache in the first place. And also uh, supports TTL to evict the stale data based on their age. And in the context of Presto, it can also support like setting the storage quotas for different tables and databases and et cetera. And then I want to show a TPCDS benchmark in a test environment and Jim will show the, his uh, production environment uh, like results here. So you can see here the, the, the red bars are without cache and the blue. Okay, hopefully is.
Might be something wrong because of the last session. Mm, fingers crossed. Okay, all right. <laughs> the, the red bar is without a luxio, and the blue bar is with a luxio. So you can see most of the times you can see a, a acceleration here. So uh, I got questions people asking me like the use cases of a luxio, and one of the most significant or important use case is acceleration or stable, like or having a more consistent, um, like the query performance or latency here. And moving to the distributed cache, you see like Aluxio can act as a uh, like a cluster with uh, with the bunch of Aluxio workers here. So we usually would uh, recommend you to co-locate Aluxio cluster with where your compute application runs. Then and then under the hood, Aluxio will serve as a virtual storage for all of your storage systems, and no matter where they are, like. We see a lot of like users using Aluxio as a storage gateway to really bridge the hybrid cloud uh, like storages. Like they have they have both storage in their uh, data centers and storage in S3 uh, in AWS S3. So they can use Aluxio as a single point of access to all of these storage systems. And uh, taking a look at the Aluxio cluster architecture here. So um, actually from the analytics or AI application perspective, so there is a Luxio client in that application. And the client would first check, uh, get the cluster info uh, from the Luxio cluster service reg registry, so usually it's an ETCD, and then, and then it, it will get the cache from the Luxio workers. And the workers are having the data sharding and based, based on some sharding policies like, uh, like the dis uh, starting policy. And also, under the hood, we have both distributed metadata store and distributed data. So why do we have the distributed metadata? Because we see oftentimes your metadata has become a bottleneck of your performance, especially when we are dealing with a lot of number of small files in the training, uh, in the training use case. And then Aluxio can handle like the caching uh, like from the under storage, and if they have the cache miss, and we will retrieve data from the under storage. If it's cache hit, and it will, uh, the applications will find the data from the Aluxio cache cluster tier. I'm going to hand it to, over to Jing to talk about how Uber has used cache for their exabyte scale data lake. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jing. I'm a software engineer in Uber, and for open source, I'm a committer and a PMC member for Apache Hadoop, as well as Apache Redis, which is an open source raft library used mainly by Ozone for data replication and metadata replication. Yeah, so today, we're glad to have this kind of chance to introduce the usage and also the learning or the experiences um, of the caching framework within Uber. So some more context. So during the past uh, several years, actually, Uber mainly used this kind of caching framework for our on-premise production environment. Uh, today, we will introduce two main use cases. One is for uh, the data storage layer, that is HDFS. The other is the um, data analytics layer, that is Presto. Um, so the key takeaway is like, uh, in the end, caching is not just about performance. More and more, it will play a very, very important role for cost efficiency. And uh, right now, Uber, we all know that like Uber is also um, doing the whole data infra migration to cloud. So, which makes us believe caching actually will play an even more important role in the future. So, yeah, we know like uh, Uber is a um, data driven company, data informs every decision at Uber. So, like, we just uh, list some of the domains here. So that's why we, during the past many years, we built maybe one of the biggest uh, data lake architecture in the whole industry. So since our on-prem is still leveraging HDFS for storing all the data for the data lake, so I just list some numbers here. So as of today, we have more than 1.5 exabytes of data stored in HDFS across two regions, almost 30 clusters, and uh, overall consisting of more than 11,000 data nodes. So 
this kind of large scale also lead to very high cost, right? So overall HDFS actually maybe contributed almost half of the cost from the whole data stack. So several years ago, we were already decided we need to adopt this kind of high density hard drive skills uh, as a unified this kind of a skill for the whole data storage layer. So for this kind of a adoption, we will gradually deprecate all these kind of a four terabyte disks and replacing them with 16 terabyte disks. So every, if you look at every single host, the storage capacity will increase from 100 terabytes to almost, or actually more than half petabytes, right? So this will actually help us reduce more than half of the hardware cost. That's uh, actually a lot of money, tens of millions of those kind of uh, dollars. So, but also this is not free. So bring us tons of these kind of new challenges. We just list uh, some of them here. The biggest one is of course the IO performance. Because if we look at those kind of new skill, uh, the IO bandwidth overall um, doesn't increase accordingly, almost the same. But you actually store 5X of the data inside of each of the host. Definitely you will see this kind of a throttling or performance degradation. We also tried that before. We just blindly put several of these kind of skills in our podcast and immediately see this kind of a performance issues. The other is reliability, right? Because we know we need to do those kind of a decommission, et cetera, et cetera, for data recovery as well. Then you decrease the total amount of data nodes by five, right? And also one single host store 5X of the data. So potentially you may have also the blast radius, those kind of issues. So today we will mainly talk about how we leverage the caching framework to help us improve the IO performance. But you can also read out what I call the uh, engineering block to learn more details about other stuff. Um, then how to solve this kind of problem. So uh, we collect a lot of traces directly from our data plane from individual these kind of data nodes across many, many clusters. Then we have this kind of interesting observation which finally hint us this kind of a performance opportunities by finally leading us to decision about the caching framework. And uh, so we have this kind of table, you can skip most of the numbers here. The key takeaway, so we have a very high concentration of the traffic. So if you look at the detailed traffic, more than 90% of the real traffic they are only touching uh, maybe uh, the top 10,000 data blocks during a 24 hour time window. So, but actually we store much, much more blocks, right? So in each of these kind of hosts. So which means, right? So if you talk about this kind of a 10K blocks and uh, we know the average, this kind of HDFS block size is usually just a couple of hundred megabytes, right? So which means you can easily just uh, cache everything for these kind of uh, hot top blocks in a cache layer and finally serve all the traffic. So final goal is offload the traffic from these kind of uh, very, very fat uh, spinning disks, right? That's the target. And we already get this kind of uh, um, assessment or say validation from the traces collected from the data node. So, Luckily, if we look at our new skill on every uh, uh, host, we actually have a four terabyte SSD disk, right? So then based on the, like, uh, the, the, the previous analysis, we still definitely can leverage this four terabyte SSD on top of each of the hosts to offload a lot of traffic. So then we decide to leverage a lot show for the overall cache management it actually, actually provide us a, a lot of good, these kind of uh, features and uh, functionalities. But if you know HDFS, you know like more than 10 years ago, we already have this kind of uh, in-memory block cache, right? Which you can just uh, pin your whole block into the data node, this kind of memory through MMM map, right? But which is uh, at like manage overall this kind of hash at the block level is very, very like, uh, how do you say, hard to operate, right? And it actually provide us those kind of a page level cache. So you don't need to like say, hey, for the whole block, like uh, 500 megabytes, I still put everything to the cache. It's not like, it's like about like uh, per page inside of this block, 
you read one single page, page maybe just uh, one megabytes, then a luxury will automatically load into the cache and uh, serve the traffic. This is also very, very important if we further look up uh, uh, like uh, in this data step, right? Because in Uber, we are using Parquet everywhere. Uh, for the Parquet reader, you look at this kind of read pattern, it's always about like less than one megabyte, this kind of read, right? You read the footer, you load the index, you load the column stats, and based on all those kind of information, you find decide which chunk of the data you find to load. And uh, we also see like uh, more than 80% of the read requests on top of HDFS, the read chunk size is actually smaller or equal to one megabytes. This also aligns with the default uh, page size coming from a large show. So everything just match. So that's why we just uh, decide to leverage uh, the Alexio to do this data node level cache. So of course, then people may ask like, uh, why we just uh, build a remote cache service, right? Because Alexio also provides that kind of mode. So several reasons. One is definitely you already see this kind of traffic pattern, which is very, very cache friendly, right? Coming from each, in, uh, the trace coming from each individual data node. So, which means you place this cache and uh, use it as a library. You already get all the benefits. So, you no longer need to manage another separate to cluster for us for this specific use case. And also, using the SDK or say the cache library and place that directly inside of data node can also decrease the potential performance penalty if you have a hash miss, cache miss, right? Otherwise, you go to the remote cache, and you still go to this kind of protocol and the remote uh, and read the this kind of data directly from HDFS. That's extra penalty there. So okay, so that's why we have this kind of architecture. Pretty simple and uh, just uh, yeah leverage the actual and uh, integrate do some small surgery inside of the HDFS code. So, but overall, it's still like uh, uh, some challenges along the this kind of uh, path. So. Uh, overall, HDFS data, if you look at the block level, right, it's uh, immutable. But we still have a pent, right? So uh, within Uber, we already try our best to minimize the usage of the pent, but the pent can still come from, let's say, hoodie, right? Or some other table format, you always do this kind of a log style that you append. Of course, edge base is another use case, but <laughs> let's just stop here. Yeah. But overall, um, how to handle a pent? Because with a pent, which means like, uh, the data cached inside uh, inside of this uh, SSD disk, right? It can become stale, right? Because if you have a, another append comes in, you also need to solve this kind of a read and write of those kind of isolation problem, right? What kind of data, what kind of state you want to expose to your ongoing readers or future readers while the append or writing is going on. So luckily, we also have this kind of a version number directly coming from HDFS internal protocol that is generation step, right? Generation step is actually the version ID to indicate different version of a data node level, this kind of block to support append, to support the write, this kind of reconstruction, et cetera. Then we directly incorporate this kind of a generation stamp inside of the cache and uh, put that into the, this kind of a cache page ID. So which means you actually can capture the full version and achieve some level of this kind of snapshot isolation to solve this kind of problem. Then read limiter. So overall we see like uh, within one single data node you have more than 500 uh, uh, terabytes of the uh, data stored there, right? You only have four terabytes of the SSD and uh, the hardware has already been purchased. There is no way to further increase. So this is a very, very like a challenging ratio for us to make sure number one, we have a very good cache heap rate. Number two, we don't write too much data into the SSD. Finally, just uh, cause this kind of SSD to be worn out quickly, right? So that's why we need to develop a certain rate limiter, this kind of a mechanism to control what data can be loaded into the cache. So of course, since we are only talking about the data node local, this kind of a cache, we no longer need to like get the heuristic from the HDFS file level, we can actually directly leverage the local traffic pattern collected from the data node and achieve some level of this kind of rate limiting. So the idea we finally developed is kind of like a sliding window 
capture this kind of access frequency of individual blocks and uh, set certain level of the threshold to control which block or say the pages belonging to that block can be loaded into the cache. This actually help us to have a very, very good control about every day how much data can be written into the cache. And uh, so we make sure that like, uh, the SSD will not be worn out and also effectively help us to improve the cache hit rate. And uh, finally, the biggest change, um, I would say like for overall this kind of caching adoption uh, is not just about solving individual challenges. It's always about like, you need to develop something. You need to, you need to uh, like, uh, always tune your design, tune your parameters, tune all these kind of uh, implementation options. How can you get this kind of enough signal even during the design and the development to help you decide which way to go, right? So you need this kind of a validation, evaluation framework and help you to achieve certain level of the decision even with such a traffic scale, right? That may be one of the biggest challenges for every distribution system, these kind of a problems, right? So what we did is like, uh, we collect the traces from our production environment. Then we do certain level of this kind of abstraction. We abstract these kind of a different traffic profile characteristics, like distribution of the offset, distribution of the read chunk size, distribution of these kind of uh, traffic on top of what uh, block files, right? All these kind of key characteristics, we abstract them out from the production traces built into a simulation framework, which can finally reproduce the similar traffic with similar disk profile. And we directly leverage this kind of a framework, evaluation framework, in our development, design, testing, rollout, right? That can actually help us like uh, clean up a lot of thoughts, different options, parameters, adoption, those kind of things. Yeah, that's uh, one of the maybe the key, these kind of learnings from this journey. And another very, very important uh, functionality directly coming from a lag show is, is shadow mode, which means you can even develop, uh, deploy the lag show cache, but not really use it in your critical path. And, but you still can collect all the metrics about the cache hit rate, about this kind of eviction throughput, et cetera, et cetera, right? So greatly reduce all these kind of rollout risks, right, or production risks but still give you all these kind of important metrics and finally help us to build enough confidence to fully roll out this feature to all our production customers. So some like a quick dashboard, I think uh, we are almost a lot of time, so I, I need to be quick, right? So uh, we deploy this feature already to all our major production clusters, including all the hot clusters. So far, due to this kind of uh, the, the, the um, host or hardware decommission speed, we have already have like uh, more than 1,000 data nodes, but that already like uh, store more than 500 petabytes of the data, right? Within this high density skill hardware with cache enabled. And you can see like uh, we draw a line here. On the left side, it's a uh, kind of like uh, the uh, throttling happening, right? The, the total number of processes blocked by IO before we have this kind of cache. But after the cache enabled, you immediately see like a, a big drop of these kind of uh, throttling scenarios. And usually based on our production experience, in a number less than 10 is okay. And the overall the performance runs fine. And uh, as of today, we can offload 60% of the IO from the spinning disks. And of course we can still maybe do some further improvement and even bump this number. And uh, also, if you look at the cache level, this kind of read throughput, the read throughput is definitely much, much better compared with the spinning disk. Okay, so this is our first use case coming from the HDFS. I still have five minutes. Hopefully, I can finish the Presto site. <laughs> yeah, so Presto. So um, uh, we also have a very large scale, this kind of Presto deployment, right? 15 clusters, two regions, all these kind of stuff. And also, the Presto read very, very heavily from HDFS. Every day to read more than 90 petabytes of the data from HDFS, sometimes even more, higher. So we have two categories of these kind of Presto clusters, interactive and batch, I will skip some details here. So um, 
as of today, right, we know HDFS has already been there for how many years? I don't know, like more than 10 years at least, or maybe 15 years, right? 15 years, yeah. So um, HDFS is a very good system in terms of this kind of uh, um, stability, right, reliability. But talking about like uh, maybe some of the issues um, we observe from our production environment, one is about the I.O. isolation, right? You don't have this kind of a very good mechanism directly from HDFS to help you handle this kind of a noisy neighbor, right? Especially at the data plan within each of the data nodes. So that's why sometimes Presto also suffer these kind of issues, right? So you have a very, very heavy load traffic coming to our production cluster, hit the HDFS layer, and you immediately see that it's kind of a slowness coming from the Presto side, right? So that's why uh, starting from 21, 2021. So our Presto team already started looking at how to leverage the actual um, cache library to build a local disk cache, right? Also on top of a local SSD inside of each Presto worker node. And finally to improve the performance. And now this feature has already been rolled out to all our Presto production clusters. But more importantly, now we find this one, this feature will play a very, very important role while Uber is migrating the traffic to cloud. Because when we move on to cloud, we will use the cloud object storage to replace HDFS. And the new thing is about its uh, new pricing items, right? One is data operations. So a lot of companies complain like the data operation cost sometimes is at the similar scale of the data storage cost coming from the cloud vendors. Then how about I cache the data at the Presto layer and uh, just uh, offload from this kind of uh, access from the remote storage, which charge you money, right? So that's why we now position this feature not only just about the performance or reliability, this is also about cost efficiency. I will skip some of the details since this is exactly the same architecture just shared by Hope. So some of the key challenges, I will just quickly go through, I mean, four challenges, right? So one is this kind of a partition level or file level, these kind of updates. HDFS file is immutable if you don't do append. However, you can still share the same file path if you rewrite the whole file, right? And the Presto local cache use the HDFS path instead of this kind of a local, this kind of a internal HDFS I know the ID as the key. So that's why you need to handle this kind of all, all, all the file gets rewritten or just replaced, right? So the, this kind of a, a solution is add this kind of modification time in sexual metadata directly as a part of the cache key that can effectively solve this kind of problem. Number two is a custom membership change. We know as a cache, you need to have this kind of a good asso uh, association, right? Between the cache, the data, and your, the place you cache the data, right? Uh, soft affinity, this kind of a uh, configuration coming from the press token give you that guarantee, but you still need to handle like uh, some node get joined or decommissioned, right? So then as a, this kind of, if you are familiar with all these kind of distributed hash table or this kind of hashing stuff, you know, consistent hashing definitely can help us to achieve further improvement. Cache size retrition. So yeah, so this is uh, the same problem we just introduced in the HDFS world, right? So the right endurance of the SSD cache, etc., uh, SSD disk, etc. So you need to have a very good control. And also this kind of control can help you to reduce the production risks, right? So that's why we have this kind of a cache filter to decide what tables or what other these kind of a specific data sets that you can find in the cache at the Presto layer. Also, the good thing is like you actually bring some good heuristic or knowledge coming from the semantic layer, from the business layer, right? into your local uh, or underneath this kind of uh, infrastructure. That's a very, very good feature. Tiny reads, this is about some API level improvement inside of uh, a luxury. I will skip the details. Uh, yeah, so actually I only have two slides. Yeah. So deployment, so we already uh, have, yeah, 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 sure. So you can read the numbers and uh, by the way, uh, we have those kind of engineering block in Uber, so you can directly go to Uber engineering block. And the last one is about cloud. So this is keep in mind that like, uh, uh, caching is not just about improving performance, also about cost reduction. Yeah. 